Let me welcome viewers from around the world to Mission Critical Water, this virtual summit on the future of water. This is the second of our three days that brings together scientists, NGOs, governments and representatives of some of the world's largest companies. As Chief Operating Officer of Syngenta Crop Protection, I take an agricultural perspective. Very important when you consider that about 70% of freshwater withdrawals are made by the agrarian sector. My company, Syngenta, is a provider and innovator of seeds and crop protection solutions for farmers around the world. One fifth of our workforce is devoted to R&D in agricultural science, spending around $1 billion a year finding ways to expand yield while shrinking agriculture's environmental footprint. We call it growing more from less. More food with less land, less energy, less soil erosion and improved labour conditions. And most relevant to our topic today, a more efficient use of water. For the next few minutes, I'd like to talk about why that is so important and how we can do it and what are some of the obstacles that exist. Each of the three days of this summit focuses on a geographic region. Today is about Europe. Seen from space, Europe is a green expanse next to the yellow parched landmass of Northern Africa. Europe is also blessed with wide rivers with great historical significance, from the Seine to the Rhine and Danube, all fed by mountain ranges covered with snow. You would think the water story of Europe is mostly one of abundance, as the long grey and rainy winters of the country of my birth would suggest. But even in the UK, water use restrictions in dry summers are becoming the rule and not the exception. And this is the case for many of the most productive agricultural landscapes of Europe. French farmers, for example, are equipped to irrigate over 13% of that country's cultivated land. And why is that? The answer is to ensure that high yields are delivered in ever-increasing periods of drought. Of course, southern Europe experiences severe water scarcity every year. Farmers there have to compete for water with the increasing urban needs of a growing number of people living there, or taking vacations in parts of Europe that are blessed with sun but only limited water resources. And still, we're better off than the rest of the world. In my native Britain, for example, agriculture requires only 3% of our national water use. By way of comparison, Farming in China takes nearly 70% of that nation's water. In India, farming share of water is close to 90%. Water stress, in fact, is approaching crisis proportions in some parts of the world. According to the 2030 Water Resources Group, a consortium of organizations from the private and public sectors, water needs will exceed current accessible, reliable supplies by 40% by 2030. There is some debate about whether or not our globe has reached peak oil, but there's one thing for certain. We are reaching peak water in relation to the increasing demand. But at the same time, water for agriculture is under pressure. Worldwide food demand is relentlessly increasing. These things are happening together. Human population is set to grow from more than 6.5 billion people today to 9 billion people by 2050. And most importantly, the new empowered global middle class, particular, particularly in India and China, will also demand richer diets, including more meat and dairy products, as well as fruits and vegetables. To meet these needs, it is estimated that we will have to double food production by 2050. That means we will have to grow twice as much corn, twice as much wheat, twice as much soybeans and rice, twice as much of everything we grow today, but without any more water than we have today, and possibly less, given other competing needs. Clearly, if you want to avoid mass starvation, deforestation, and hitting a limit on water resources, you need a major game changer. That game changer can only be technological innovation in agriculture. We simply have no choice but to find new ways to grow more food with less water. And we need to grow more of it where water is abundant for most of the time, as is the case in Europe. 
The good news is we can do this. More efficient irrigation methods, such as drip irrigation, is an important and obvious step. But new seed treatments, breakthroughs in seed breeding, genetic modification, herbicides and new chemical treatments that enhance plants all hold the promise of making crops more drought resistant and producing greater yields in more arid areas and doing this without damaging the environment. This is called sustainable intensive agriculture. In a few moments, I will elaborate on this point with more examples of how technology can help us to grow more crop per drop. For now, I want to get to another critical issue that politics and public policies have the power to block access to that technology and kill promising new technologies before they are developed. In assessing Europe's water future, therefore, we really need to look at European policies from a global perspective. Are these policies helping or hurting global water sustainability in agriculture? The truth is that EU policies are often contradictory, pulling in two opposite directions. On one hand, at the Aquila G8 summit, EU leaders joined in the call to share agricultural science and technology with the developing world. The EU's Everything But Arms programme also commendably opens rich markets to poor countries. On the other hand, the EU's restrictive application of the precautionary principle approach to agricultural technology is starting to prevent the optimal use of some of the most fertile and potentially productive farmland on Earth. As a result of the EU's effective ban on genetically modified crops, and its antagonism to modern crop technologies in general, Europe's agricultural exports have declined in the last decade, and Europe has emerged as the world's largest agricultural importer. If you look at the commodities we import, mainly animal feed, sugar and vegetable oils, the hectares needed to sustain this agricultural policy increase Europeans' footprint drastically. Every year, in fact, Europe imports virtual land equal to the size of Germany. Unlike Germany, however, this virtual land is often low quality and subject to drought. But the problem is not just that water-rich Europe is the world's biggest importer. We are also sometimes the exporter of regulations and practices that inhibit the adoption of water-saving technologies, especially in the developing and emerging nations where they are so desperately needed. This unequal relationship is what make Europe, makes Europe's questionable application of the precautionary principle so pernicious. Europe, standing on its own, would not be able to feed itself under our own regulatory regime. The EU not only makes up for its food gap with massive imports, it also uses its clout to try and dissuade many in Africa, Asia and elsewhere from adopting the very modern agricultural technologies with the necessary field support and know-how needed to grow the crops to feed their own people. The EU is starting to treat agricultural technology as a mere lifestyle choice. But for the developing and emerging nations, it is more of a life or death choice. Organic food is perhaps fine for those who can afford it, but organic farming is on average 40% less productive and every gram of crop lost means wasting precious water. This begs a few critical questions. Is it sustainable for the EU to be increasing our food and environmental demands on a world where water shortages are increasingly common? Is it a good thing to urge other countries to adopt inefficient agricultural practices that lead to de deforestation in an age of climate change? Is it responsible to keep deepening our environmental footprint in these countries? We don't have to, if we simply increased our own agricultural productivity by three-tenths of a percent a year, that would reduce the EU's net importation of land by 5.3 million hectares. We should also be doing everything in our power to fulfill the promise of the Aquila Conference to share technology. We have to work towards a sustainable future based on science-driven productive growth. We have to grow more from less, not tell others to make do with less. Unfortunately, we in the developed world often lecture and lobby developing nations to stay away from the very agricultural technology they need to stretch their water resources and feed themselves. 
In the name of precaution, we risk importing comfort and exporting bad policy. We can't continue down this path. From my perspective, we must choose between two broad approaches to sustainability. One approach is built on gestures of decency. A coffee house chain, for example, might pay more money to coffee farmers. It might increase the fraction of recycled paper in its paper cups. It might find ways to brew coffee with less energy. There's nothing wrong with any of this. It is not greenwashing. Indeed, these are very good things to do. Every company should engage in these kinds of efforts, and so should every individual. But if we're going to grow twice as much food with the same amount of water without cutting down all our remaining forests, it's clear we're going to have to do more than partially recycle coffee cups. This brings me to the other kind of effort that could be called inherent stability, sustainability, one that governments as well as companies must embrace. These are efforts that do more than just reduce single impacts. They optimize inputs for a sustainable outcome. They make structural transformations that can bring enormous benefits to the environment whilst raising the foundation of the world economy. This kind of sustainability is based on fundamental research. It is pre-competitive, built into the system before it becomes a consumer choice. Inherent sustainability is not, then, a competition to see who is greener than who. It is a matter of creating resource efficiencies at the base of the supply chain. It is fair to ask, of course, does inherent sustainability work? My answer is that I can think of no other environmental policy that has already enjoyed such outstanding success. A notable economist estimated that if the average yields of 1961 still prevailed in 1998, cropland would have more than doubled, covering an increased area nearly the size of South America. Thanks to improved agricultural technology and mechanization, however, the amount of land under cultivation has remained relatively stable. We have no alternative but to perform the same kind of feat with water. As we look to the environmental challenges ahead, we are increasingly seeking fundamental, systematic changes in industry, most notably in the energy sector. When it comes to agriculture, however, we often apply no such standard at all. Instead of looking at our industry in the hard light of the challenges before us, we too often view it as nothing more than a lifestyle choice. We allow critical policy decisions to be made on the basis of a bucolic vision of the farmer that never really was and can never be. My contention is that agriculture should and must be held to the same high standard that we today demand of every other sector. When it comes to agriculture, we should expect the same kind of upward curve in sustainability we see in electronics and telecommunications and the more benign inputs expected from alternative energy. That's where growing more from less comes in. More yield with less land, less water, less energy, less carbon released into the atmosphere. We're convinced that our ability to grow more from less will indeed give us the kind of quantum shift in water efficient production we need, allowing us to meet the world's food needs while shrinking agriculture's environmental footprint. But we all have to work together to ensure the spread of the enabling solutions. We will need stronger partnerships between farmers, governments, NGOs, schools, and public research institutes to raise agronomy skills and share expertise around the world. Advancing technology will also require robust protection of intellectual property. Knowledge, once acquired, may be universal, but in agriculture, more than any other area, that knowledge has to be adapted to local conditions, soil, climate, weather, infrastructure, and markets. That means we'll need to work together, and by we, I mean private industry, governments and other stakeholders, to create mechanisms that enable local scientists and agronomists to access what you might call the genetic source code, while still protecting the investment that went into developing it in the first place. In short, we need a new paradigm of how to share useful knowledge in a codified way that is fair and standardized. Critically important, of course, is supplying farmers with the best tools. In 2011, Syngenta will become the first company 
to offer farmers new corn seed that can use available moisture more efficiently, resulting in higher yields on water-stressed acres. This new technology has demonstrated the potential to preserve up to 15% more yield under drought stress and represents a new approach to water optimization. Such corn hybrids not only have the potential to reduce water use in irrigated farming, but also provide a critical hedge against drought. Another example of an innovative but simple solution to more water efficiency was developed in partnership between the International Rice Research Institute, IRI, and Syngenta. Called Pani Pipe technology, it enables farmers to determine when it is necessary to irrigate. By using a Pani Pipe, farmers have shown that they can save up to 30% of the nearly 5,000 litres of water needed to produce one kilogram of rough rice. Other water savings come from seed care, crop protection, crop enhancement and plant growth regulator products that help farmers grow healthy and strong crops even during droughts. For example, the application of some plant growth regulators increase yields up to 25% while reducing water requirement by some 15%. Some crop enhancement products improve a plant's ability to manage water stress by greatly expanding its root growth. Other technologies reduce the plant's loss of moisture through its leaves. Modern herbicides also have an added benefit. By replacing an ancient technology, the plough, and enabling minimum tillage agriculture, which keeps soil structure more intact and therefore keeps more water stored in the soil. It also significantly reduces surface runoff and increases soil organic matter, dramatically reducing greenhouse gas emissions. These are the kind of technologies in which European policy and European leadership could make all the difference in the world. Global food security leadership is the challenge of our times. We can work together to connect people with technology and to promote the efficient use of land and other resources. If we do that, we can start to realize the full potential of sustainable agriculture. We don't have to chop down one more tree to feed our growing population. We don't have to deplete our aquifers and suffer the dislocations and political unrest that will inevitably res result. We don't have to accept an era characterized by ever deepening water crises. The challenge before us is not our ability to overcome these problems, it is simply our willingness to make the right choices. On the part of business, it will mean change, particularly accelerating innovation to develop and train customers in technology adapted to the challenges of sustainable intensive agriculture. On the part of the public sector, it will require the courage to legislate and regulate based on science, not fear. For us all, it will mean breaking down barriers, embracing new partners, and working together toward new solutions. Thank you.